I believe that we are at a very, very great turning opportunity in our existence on the planet. But time, as it was mentioned by Dr. Earle, is of the essence. We can no longer blah, blah. We need action, action, and action. And the best gift that we can make is to provide young people with the information which will allow them to make the right decisions. We didn't know before. It's not an issue of blaming anybody, whether governments, industries. We all in the same vessel. We need to sit down, communicate with those decision makers, and provide them with the information which will allow them to make better decisions. In the meantime, we need to have a new generation who is going to be a lot more responsible than we have been. We have excuses, but now we don't. And in the future, it's less even so. As much as frustrating sometimes it is, the alternative is not very interesting. And I rediscovered a few days ago a <laughs> message that I sent 11 years ago when I said bon voyage into the 21st century with this wonderful young lady who was giving a flower to the star of the movie Free Willy, Keiko, before we released him, and he went wild after four and a half years of work. And I wrote, and I will read only part of this, to remind ourselves that we haven't done much in 11 years. But the essence of what we can do is really based on the same thing. I remember when my father told me when I was in the Amazon and we had to release a uh, creature that had been put in jail and needed to be protected. When my dad said, you know, Jean-Michel, people protect what they love. And that's when I wrote, beyond the pragmatic consideration of our own survival, I believe we must love nature for its own sake. We are nature, after all, and cannot help loving the spark of nature within our own beings. Self-acceptance, a respect for the dignity of others, and a reverence for nature are all inextricably linked in ourselves in, and in our power to love. We cannot shape the world outside of ourselves in a just and peaceful way if we do not blend our inner ecology with love. Love is our ultimate strength. Everybody has a way of loving more than the world and the number, more than the atom and the chip. Love is why we have advanced to societies capable of gazing across the cosmos and tracing the trails of time. We have not always let ourselves be motivated by love. Often we have become bewitched by our apparent power to control the world around us. With love comes understanding and the humility to realize that we are vulnerable yet strong. It gives us the strength to deal with our difficult past and the confidence to move into the great adventure of the future. So I will say, like I said 11 years ago, welcome into 2011. I really believe that this year is a turning point in our history, in the history of planet 
ocean. And I would like to leave you with a magic moment, a moment which inspires, makes you think, decide, and say, yes, I can do it, and decide what it is. Every one of us, as we communicate as ambassadors of planet ocean, we can bring it to the ones who haven't had the privilege we have. We, I believe, will make it. Because before, I was used to say, how can you protect what you don't understand? And today, I said, as my father told me, people protect what they love because we can. We know what we need to do. So spending a few minutes, as we did for two hours and 20 minutes on rebreathers, under a scientist's permit, being in the presence of those magical creatures who used to be on land and have moved into the ocean, are breathing like we do, are warm-blooded like we are, give birth, take care of their young. What a magic opportunity that we have. What an extraordinary chance that we are on this planet in our solar system. You know, I'm looking at, and I know it's not very uh, emotional or perhaps uh, the way that some people would like to describe it. But if we look at planet Earth as we look at a business, if we look at planet Earth as being the capital that has been made available to us, and if we manage it like you manage a business, and if you live off the interests that is produced by that capital, you can go on forever. If you go beyond the interest produced by the capital, with the pressure we add all the time with another 100 million people every year, you start to gobble up the capital, which is what we're doing today. And everybody knows we're heading toward bankruptcy. No one wants to go there. No one. And everyone can contribute to the better management of that capital and only love live off the interest, and in so doing, improve your quality of life by improving your standard of living. I just realized I had a hybrid. I was very proud of my hybrid. Ooh, I have a hybrid. Na na. <laughs> then I said, oh, OK. Maybe there are different hybrids. And I said, do I need this car? Do I need a different car? Oh, yeah, I travel a lot. I'm in many places all the time. I don't need a big car, I need a little car, tiny little car. So I got a little hybrid. And I look at the numbers. And I can tell you at the end of the year, I will save with the same income, $6,000. I can invite many of you to have dinner together. I couldn't do it before. My standard of living has improved. It's better. Oh, by the way, <laughs> you're helping the environment too. So if we make it a consequence of our management, I think we get everybody to listen. Because when I was telling you about money, you were listening. If I go outside and I talk to anybody in the street about money, they will listen. If I talk about the environment, eh, maybe a third. So there is a way, I think, to improve the quality of life for every human being. It's an issue of how we present it and what we do. I've been traveling enormously in the last five weeks from India to South Africa by the way of uh, the seashells, and uh, don't feel bad for me. I, I was very happy. <laughs> then I went to uh, Hawaii, and then I went to Indonesia, where I met uh, 30 um, 
university representatives. And then I just come back four days ago from uh, French Polynesia, where I met the owner of the Intercontinental in Bora Bora. And I said, uh, Richard, tell me about what you've done there. And he said, yeah. He said, I'm picking up the water at 100 meters, and I'm bringing it to the hotel, and I'm circulating all over in the air conditioning of the hotel, and I'm putting that water in touch back in the ocean. And I said, oh, great. And I said, after you've amortized your investment, how much time does it take? A year and a half, two years. And I said, how much money uh, do you save? He said, oh, we're already saving half a million dollars. And it will be up to a million, a million two. We were talking about money. And then I said, oh, by the way, you, you're helping the environment. They said, oh, yeah, 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 we're helping the environment. But it, I, instant attention. And then I go diving there, and because of the untreated sewage, because of a hurricane that took place in February last year, because of the removing of the natural predators of the acantaster, or the, uh, the sea star, uh, which is uh, feeding on the plants that are a part of the coral reefs, the reef is dead, dead, completely dead. 20, 30 years ago, I used to go there, and it was very healthy, it was beautiful, it was great. It was shocking, I was in a desert. But then I went to Fakarava. Sounds weird, huh? I have not seen a reef as healthy as I saw there. Very few people, enough not to affect the reef. We can do it. It's not too late. There are places that are still in perfect conditions today. We have a chance to turn things around. And if you have any doubt or anybody you meet who are not as convinced as we are, tell them to look at a little kid, a five-year-old in the eyes, and say it. I will never, never let you down. I hope you enjoy the Humpback Ballet. Could we have the next DVD, please?
Jean Michel, you forgot to take your award. But before I give it to you, before I give it to you, I have been, as they say in this, oh, well, I'll give it to you right now. <laughs> if you insist. Oh, oh, oh. I didn't know. Thank you, thank you. I didn't know I was getting an award. Thank you very much. Don't, don't go yet. Don't go yet. As we, as we say in the State Department, I have been instructed <laughs> to tell you that there is no free lunch, and therefore a few questions have been assembled while we both, while I was watching the film and listening to you. For and me? if you would, for you, and if you would. What about Sylvia? That's uh, unfair. That, that, that's not in my talking points. <laughs> but um, uh, anyway, people are waiting for us outside. But I think maybe if you could quickly answer any of them. You, you, you know why they want to go drinking? That's uh, why. That's part of the tradition. <laughs> yes. Can you meet with some of the climate change deniers? and those who are not convinced by scientific data, people in the U.S. Congress. And how can we reach these important people, people who have, they just make the decisions that make our policy? Well, Could you try to arrange to meet with some? Have you? Absolutely. Uh, I, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, I, and, and Sylvia too, and many of us, we provided what we're not there to attack point fingers accuse these people, but as I mentioned earlier, you reach for the heart, everybody has one, we sit down and we have a conversation. It doesn't mean we have to agree in the end, but at least, yes, and I have never been denied a meeting except by one president of a big corporation, I won't name it, uh, it's in the past, a long time ago, uh, otherwise, I've always been able to uh, sit down because we're not there to, come on, <laughs> are we going to send them on another planet? No, we're there to have a dialogue. And yes, I'll meet anybody who wants to meet with us. That's the first question. Now, based on your studies of the Gulf after the oil spill, what is your prognosis for the water, the wetlands, and the wildlife? Well, number we one, I, yet, I'm not a prophet. Uh, we need the scientific community to work very, very hard. We need to listen to the local people. We need to go and, and, and watch what's going on. I know a, a, a fisherman who's lost his job uh, and his brother works for the oil industry. What's happening socially? What's happening with that family? Yeah. What's going on? I mean, it's not just the fish and, and uh, you know, e everything is, is critical, and that's why I want to do an ongoing report, and we can go from what's happening with the plankton to what's happening with the oil industry, what's happening with the, uh, the turtles that uh, have laid their eggs on the beach, and some very nice people came, recovered the eggs, went in their lab, and made those baby turtles b be born, and then they take the little babies and they go release them on the east coast of Florida. What's happening to that female turtle in two years from now when she comes back and want to lay her eggs where she was born? Mm. Are we gonna bring her back to the lab? I mean, there are all kinds of interesting questions which we need to raise today. It's not over yet. And it's fascinating in a way, but I think, you know, I wanna go back to Prince William Sound and talk to those people there uh, because Things haven't been resolved yet. And uh, so it's an issue of sitting down with all those people who can make a difference for us to understand how we can avoid doing it again. How, is the infrastructures rotting away? I'm a little concerned because, you know, I was thinking about what happened in San Francisco, near San Francisco, with the, the gas pipeline that blew up and killed people also. Uh, is the infrastructure rotten? Do we need to think about that? Mm -hmm. My freeway is a third world freeway. 
It, it damages your scar, it's bumping, it's broken, and we're doing patch up. Uh, we have problems. We or, the, to, we, or the bridges that fall. Or bridges that fall. Yeah. So it's all connected. It and, and I think we can take care of it. We can face up to it. And we will. Yeah, but we're not now. Yeah, yeah we're starting. We're, we have we're to starting. Start. So kick in the... <laughs> Please, there are children present here. <laughs> the Ross Sea. The Ross Sea in the Southern Ocean is argued to be the most pristine ocean area on Earth. There are efforts underway under the Antarctic Treaty System to establish a Ross Sea um, marine protected area. What do you believe needs to be done to ensure that the Ross Sea gets its protection? Well, I, I think uh, Sylvia addressed that issue and showed some very great uh, uh, important pictures. We, we haven't protected 1% of the planet ocean. We have 12% on land, we need to immediately protect 10% and the best that we can and then do more uh, in the future. The good news is that a few weeks ago we were in Hawaii with the representative of 34 countries who uh, represented 42, I think, uh, marine protected areas sanctioned by, the, uh, by UNESCO. And I think it was the first time that all these people got together and we have an opportunity to work together, expand, and help those people. Because, uh, you know, when I did the show about the marine protected areas in the United States, the, the questions that people were telling or were asking us were unbelievable. It was shocking. Uh, I can believe it. I, I, I can give you some of those answers, which, you know, when. This guy said, oh, I didn't know that the Marines had a protected area. Uh, well, wait a minute, you know. They don't so, need protection. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I heard, yeah. and, and many, many, I have a film on that, which one day I'll show. I hope here. Yeah, and the answer, so education. Education, 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 and we need to pass that on. You know, we need to take the kids out of school. They are in jail and we need to get them wet. You know something, you, you must be, um, uh, uh, what's the word, um, that you divine before I say anything because you just answered the last question about ah. education of children. I mean, it, it's becoming pretty much obvious. It should be in every school. Uh, it should be part of the curriculum. And we've tried to do that for a long time. Thanks to my dad, he pushed me overboard when I was seven. And when I, when I was supposed to go to school, I was going to fish uh, octopus. And I would sail the octopus to uh, the uh, police officer. Right? He would pay me. So I could go and, uh, go and buy some marbles. And, uh, and I missed a lot of schools that way. And my, my parents didn't know. Uh, and, did I suffer from that, or did I gain from being exposed to the marine environment, particularly when today I go exactly to the same place where I used to pick up those octopus, there's none left, they're gone. Can I say that to the young people in those schools where now there's a, a, a school that bears my name where I grew up? It's frightening. It's so <laughs> we, we're going to change that. I want the octopus to be back there. Well, we share something as well because um, my father, who was a naval officer in World War I, also threw me into the water when I was about six years old. <laughs> and I love to swim. But did you have a tank on your back? No, no, no. No, it wasn't that kind of water. I mean, oh, so you were, you were a, real, was, a real diver. In, in the Atlantic, right? yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you sometime about my, and Sylvia also, about my, my communion with a white-tipped gray shark uh, off the great, when I was snorkeling off the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. But that's another story. Come back next year. I want to make sure you have all your fingers. Yeah. You yes, I did. No, no. Well, I say I use the word communion and not confrontation. No, no, no. I know. Because I was yes. I've been diving with great yes. white sharks, and you know, if there's no blood, if the visibility is good, right. they right. come, they look at you, and they leave. We we don't taste and good. They were all yeah. <laughs> I had that feeling that that she had already had her feeding, and, and but the funny thing was that as we crossed, this was kind of. 
um, I'm, you know, I haven't done near the amount of diving or, or snorkeling. But as our paths crossed, I was going so, and she was coming so, and... And he was a female, and we you know that. Well, in, uh, yes, I think so. I, think so. <laughs> uh, I was about to describe the way she was looking at me. <laughs> because I, I was, of course, you know, a little nervous, but I, still, I, I was looking out of the side, you know, looking over to, just to check her out, see what she was doing. And as we crossed, I could see her eye following me exactly the same that's way right. to see what I was going to do. That's right. Yeah. That's right. She was scared of you. Well, <laughs> or, some, or something. <laughs> Good. Okay. Any more? Well, that's I guess it? that's it. I think that's it. We can now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.